This is Melody King, longtime animal advocate and host of The Animal Agenda, airing every Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. on KPFK. Each week, I'll talk with guests about animal-related issues from all around Los Angeles and Southern California. This week, we'll welcome back actor, author, animal activist, and shelter volunteer Tom Keish. We'll have a conversation about selecting pets that are a good fit for you and your family. That's The Animal Agenda this Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. right here on KPFK, 90.7 FM in Los Angeles and online at kpfk.org. Have you ever heard the saying, the only person's behavior I can control is my own? Well, here's your chance to exercise the power of one. Make the decision to support KPFK right now and call with your contribution. Your individual decision helps support the programs that are important to you and your community. And your contribution may just inspire someone else to contribute. Call 818-985-5735. That's 818-985-KPFK. Or go to kpfk.org and pledge securely online. This is Julian Sands. You're listening to Radio Powered by the People, KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles and streaming on the web at kpfk.org. Welcome to the Animal Agenda on KPFK. I'm Melody King, a longtime animal advocate and founder of Los Feliz Animal Rescue. Each week, I'll have a guest to discuss one particular issue. This week, I'm talking again with actor, author, animal activist, and shelter volunteer, Tom Keish. Welcome back, Tom. Hello, hello, hello. And so today, in advance for the holidays, what we're going to be talking about is how to select the pet that is right for you and your family. A lot of people just pick an animal they think is cute, bring it home, it doesn't work out. So we're going to try and help people avoid that situation. I think that's an excellent idea. So So what I would love to title this episode, if there is an episode title, is Ask Not What Animal Is Right For You, But Ask Yourself What Animal Are You Right For. Perfect. I like the voice, too. Thanks. (laughs) Just waking up. (laughs) So... Now, your experience is primarily with dogs. I know you have cats, but your experience, you know, with the shelter, volunteering and everything, you have a lot of experience with a lot of different types of dogs. And I know that sometimes when people go to the shelter to pick out a dog, there are some certain things that they should look for or not look for. So can you tell us a little bit about that? I can 100% tell you about that. So what I would love to say is in a perfect world, the first thing people should do before getting a pet is to be around a lot of animals, to get experience, to get their hands on fur, to experiment with other sizes and ages and personalities and breeds. And the best way to do that is to volunteer with a rescue or a shelter. Just get around animals so you can meet hundreds of animals and you can raise your animal IQ. I think that's the most important thing. And if you do that, all the questions that we're going to ask and all the things we're going to talk about, you will answer yourself over time. But if you can't do that, or you don't have the patience to do that, then maybe there's some things you should think about before getting an animal for yourself. So what are what are those things that they should think about ahead of time? So a less ideal situation would be sort of tackling the preconceived notions that people have about animals. And I think that's the biggest hurdle that we have when people come to the shelter looking for animals. It's as if they have an idea of what breed they want and what color they want. And so the first thing I would say is what breed and why? And, and so let's play this game. Like what what breed are you looking for and why are you looking for that breed? Just make something up. I want a golden doodle. Right. So we would explore that, right? Like everyone has in their brain a breed when they come in there and a color. So it's like, what color do you want? What breed do you want? And where do you see this animal in your life? Like, and where did you first see this animal? Did you see a cartoon? Did you meet your friend's dog? That's a golden doodle. Did you uh, see it in a movie? And, and what is it about that specific animal that you have connected to? So like golden doodle, where did you first see your first golden doodle? Um, I, let's pretend I saw it at my, I saw my friend's golden doodle and I was, uh, attracted to the fact that they are supposedly hypoallergenic. 
perfect. So that we would tackle that sort of idea of are they actually hypoallergenic and why is that important to you? And then a lot of these movie dogs or cartoon dogs are not actual real dogs. They're trained and they're doing things by trainers putting in thousands of hours. So it's like getting over the dream world and getting into the reality of the breed and the dogs that are in front of us. Um, the other thing is like what age do you see in your in your brain? What age dog are you looking for? I'm looking for a puppy because I want to be able to train it from the very beginning and have it be all fresh and just know me and not have to deal with any previous issues. That's perfect. So, like, that's what we hear the most is people are like, where are the puppies? And a puppy comes with a ton of responsibility and a ton of time required. It also requires the most training and a lot of puppies at least at the shelter or even with many breeders, you'd have no idea what that dog's going to be in three years, how big they're going to be or their temperament. A lot of breeders that say they're breeding purebreds are lying through their teeth, especially if you're buying them in a parking lot. And at a shelter, you have no idea what the mix is. So um, I would tackle that with somebody. Like there's a lot to a puppy. Uh, what's the energy level you're looking for in your brain? What's your perceived energy level? Medium. I can I can walk a dog a couple times a day, but I don't want it running around my apartment, and I don't I I do work a lot. So right, perfect. So when you look at that versus puppy, it doesn't match up, right? Puppies have a ton of energy, and the puppy in front of you today is not going to be the dog in front of you two years from now. So it's like again tackling these pre preconceived ideas. What what's the reason that you want a dog? I want my kids to have a dog to grow up with and and learn about pet ownership and responsibility. Great. So those are things that are important. Um, what's the purpose of this imaginary dog that we're talking about? Does my dog need a purpose? Yeah, there's a purpose to everything we do. So is is do you are you getting this animal because you think the dog is going to protect your home? Are you getting this dog because you have no friends and you can't communicate with people? Are you getting this dog because you want to post about it on Instagram? I again would like to have it for my children and it could be a companion for them and they could learn more about animals. Perfect. So that's that's sort of a purpose, would you agree? Yes. Yeah. Um, what's this animal cost you? I am hoping it will be a couple hundred dollars. Okay. So what's tricky about that, right, is that an animal doesn't cost you once. So many times shelters run these free events and people think, oh, it's free. That is a huge misconception. Animals, as you know, being a rescuer and a pet owner, cost a lot of money. A lot. A lot. They cost a weekly for food. They require vets. Uh, they require, some of them require um, grooming because uh, they don't shed. Some require medical. And as they get older, they can require more money. So, again, another preconceived idea is like, what are you willing to spend on your pet? And then how committed are you to this imaginary dog we're talking about, this puppy? Oh, I believe I'm committed. You do. Great. And what's your timeline? Uh, my timeline is I need to have it by Christmas. Right. So what the timeline is, it's not only like when you need it by, but that's a perfect lead in because a lot of people are getting animals for Christmas. And that is one reason why we're having this, this topic today, I believe. Absolutely. But it's also like... What do you expect from the dog? What timeline do you expect to put on this dog? So do you expect a perfect dog right out of the box, like a, some sort of iPhone? Because we get a lot of dogs returned at the shelter because they're like, it doesn't do this or it, it doesn't get along with my home animals. And they expect it to happen instantly. So the, a realistic idea is like, what is the realistic timeline that you expect to have this fantasy dog that is somehow in your brain um, before you came to the shelter or before you started looking for a dog? Well, I'm on holiday for a couple of weeks, so I need to be able to leave it alone by the time I need to go back to work in mid-January. Perfect. So those are some things that are um, so some preconceived ideas that I think people have to get through. And then 
I came up with this idea this morning, and I haven't worked it out, but I'd love to come up with a game, like a just a game where it's like, here's the answers. The answers are volunteer, adopt, foster, purchase, visit, stuffed animals, or AI. <laughs> and the questions are, what's right for you? Right? Like, some people, like... When I first started volunteering, the whole reason I started volunteering was I wasn't allowed to have a dog where I was living. So in order to fulfill, get my dog on, I started volunteering with dogs. And that's turned into 20 plus years of volunteering and getting to know thousands of dogs and helping dogs out and getting dogs to all places in the States and Canada and just learning so much about dogs and raising my dog IQ that that has been my life. And... Um, my love and I I love that more than owning a dog myself at this point because I am able to touch the lives of so many dogs and so many people and make things better for so many animals so that was the right idea and the right answer for me at the time and honestly it's probably still the right answer for me so the other one is adopt right we talked about adopt so is adoption the right thing for you the listener and I also want to say, if this program makes sense to you, if you have a friend that's considering an animal, share this program with them. Absolutely. This is stuff that people should think about. And if people thought about it before they got an animal, <clears throat> we'd have less animals coming back to the shelter or being surrendered. I'm Melody King, and you're listening to The Animal Agenda on KPFK. Today, my guest is actor, author, animal activist, and shelter volunteer, Tom Keish. And I want to touch on the animal IQ for a second yes. because one, there are things people can do prior to even getting so far as to thinking about these things is do your research on the breeds. A lot of people have really mis, uh, misconceived notions about specific breeds. They don't know the activity level of a particular breed that they think they want. And these are things that you, you know, I, I have people all the time saying my apartment I need a small dog because I live in an apartment. And there are actually plenty of larger sized dogs that are completely comfortable in an apartment and are not active dogs. As in my experience, it seems to be that the little dogs and specific breeds like the Huskies and the Border Collies are actually much less well suited to an apartment than, say, a Great Dane who is generally a couch potato. So those are excellent points. Um, and I agree with those. I, I, um, I think it all depends on the entire picture that you present. Like an, a very active dog can do fine in an apartment if the person who owns that animal is willing to take that dog out on very long walks every single day. Yes. So I know a, a super husky that does incredibly well with his owner and they have a small place. And that is one of the best Huskies I've ever met. But she takes that dog out and crushes miles. So that dog is very happy. But if you took that same dog and put it in a tiny apartment and you expected the dog to be happy with a walk around the block every other day, that is going to be a very frustrated animal that's going to chew apart your apartment. Absolutely. So going back to this answer game, uh, adoption, it's like, do you have the time? Do you have the resources? Do you have the temperament? Do you have the right scenario? The next answer was foster. Maybe you maybe you want to make the commitment, but you travel too much, but you can commit to six months at a time. Well, maybe you should foster an animal because you would help out a rescue like Los Sabilas Animal Rescue or one of the other thousands of rescues out there. And you could temporarily home animals. And while you're, fo while you're fostering animals, you're getting your hands on fur, you're raising your dog IQ, you have a support network behind you. So if there are medical concerns, the rescue will, for the most part, pick that up. And some rescues even um, allow food expenditures and things like that. So fostering might be the best answer for people who are listening instead of adopting um, or maybe in addition to volunteering. And I'd like to direct people, we did an episode solely on fostering. So if people have questions or concerns about fostering, that show is available on the kpfk.org archives, you know, because some people will think, I don't want to get emotionally attached. How expensive is it? All, like all those things you were just talking about. So that's another uh, resource for people who are interested in fostering. That That is interesting. I I have some notes in front of me for those who aren't 
in the studio. But emotional attachment is a is a funny thing because you're going to get emotionally attached, period. Regardless if you volunteer, adopt, foster, purchase, visit, get a stuffed animal, or even do AI. You're going to get emotionally attached. That's the thing. That's why we have pets. That's the importance of pets. I've learned more about my humanity and people through animals than anything. I've learned more about acting, volunteering with animals than anything. I've learned more about life through animals Mm -hmm. than anything else. So I think fostering is a great opportunity for people, either who are experienced or who want to try on a dog or want to try on a cat. You do have to make a commitment, and you will get emotionally attached, but that's the beauty of it. And another great situation for fostering, uh, I was speaking about this with quite a few people this weekend, um, is if you have other animals and you're not sure, you're, you don't want to make the permanent commitment because you're not sure if it'll be a good match with your other animals, fostering is perfect. You can take the animal and see how they mesh with your household and, um, and then decide whether or not it's a good fit. 100%. Um, fostering is a way to sort of test drive while being of service to a rescue. Absolutely. So the the next one, purchase. A lot of people who may be listening or who are in rescue or volunteer are so against people buying dogs. And the reality is it's a reality. And some people have such a tight uh, idea of what they want or have such uh, allergy reasons or whatever that they are forced or feel forced that they have to purchase. First off, I volunteer at many different shelters and I can tell you that there are so many different breeds and all kinds of dogs at shelters within 20 miles of wherever you live. And there are many breed specific rescues as well. 100%. So if you're purchasing because you think you need a specific breed, I think you're just being lazy and you're clueless of what the reality is that are in rescues and shelters. But if you go down that route, know that not all breeders are ethical. Not all breeders are not ethical or unethical. There's a variety in them as well. And you're not always going to get the dog that you think you, you want through a breeder. Just because a breeder sold you a dog doesn't mean it's a purebred If it has paperwork, maybe it is uh, valid. I don't know. But there are so many dogs that are not the dogs that people think they're going to get. And six months later, the dog is much bigger than they thought or has different temperament. Or because it's been genetically bred so much, the dog's not nearly as healthy as a dog you would have got at the shelter with a mix of bloodline. Absolutely. And to touch back on your point about uh, puppies and their personalities, and this is the same with cats, you know, you don't know what personality you're getting. When you get a baby, you don't know what it's going to be like. You, you know, get to to a toddler stage and you learn more about it. I tell people, you know, if you're looking for an animal and you know what kind of animal you want, like if you want a cat that's uh, a lap cat or you want a cat that to play with your other cats and your kids, get a cat that's a little older, even six months to a year. They're what I call partially baked. If you get a cat over two to three years, it's fully baked. You know what it is, and you can have a better sense of it if it's going to be a good fit. I agree 100%. With breeders, you're going to get a puppy that you have no clue what you're going to get. At the shelter, uh, especially Baldwin Park, which is one of the shelters I volunteer at, we're seeing so many dogs from the ages of like four months to a year, and it's because they're either breeders that are dumping the dogs that couldn't sell, or they're dogs that people got seeing one puppy in front of them and they turn into something else four months later when they get a a relatively or large size or an energy level that they didn't see in the puppy but has blossomed inside this animal. Do people really think that puppies aren't going to grow to be a bigger size? (laughs) Yeah, we have dogs. We literally have had dogs at the shelter returned within a week because they were too big. If you can make sense out of that. No. Like literally a week later, like, yeah, the dog's too big. Oh, my goodness. It's because they didn't do any thinking. And that's what this whole program that we're doing today is about, is think before you get an animal, because it's not just your life, but it's the animal's life. It's Absolutely. the animal's entire life. Absolutely. So then, um, so people do purchase, that's a reality, but there are so many ways to get an animal without purchasing that will be of service to the community and the animal. 
Visit was another answer, and that is visit shelters, visit rescues, visit friends that have dogs, maybe even do dog walking on the side. Just maybe that's your answer. Maybe that's how you get your animal on. Maybe you do uh, cat sitting because you, you really shouldn't have a cat, but you love cats and you want to be around cats. Maybe you, you sit at a rescue with cats and do that or, or learn what it's like to have a cat before you have a cat or a dog or know what it's like to walk a dog every day. So visiting is an answer, like volunteer, adopt, foster, purchase, visit. The next answer is stuffed animal. Some people get an animal when they really would be better served getting a stuffed animal. And, and that might sound stupid, but it's true. They just want something to cuddle with, and they don't want a dog or a cat or a pig or a horse or whatever to have an actual personality and have a life. Like, these things get older they they age just like we age. They have needs. They have personalities. Maybe a stuffed animal is the answer for the person that's thinking about an animal. If you don't want any maintenance on the animal, if you are like a germaphobe and you don't want to deal with animal poop, then definitely that is the answer for you. I'm Melody King, and you're listening to The Animal Agenda on KPFK. My guest today is actor, author, animal activist, and shelter volunteer, Tom Keish. If you're going to get a horse, you're going to shovel horse poop. Like you're Absolutely. G- you're going to, or you have to have the money to, to spend that, and that's thousands of dollars a month. And the last answer, so we have volunteer, adopt, foster, purchase, visit, stuffed animal, and the last one is AI. And while I'm being cute about it, I'm also not. Like if you're only getting a puppy... Because you want to post about it on your Instagram, which is sick and as weird and as twisted as that sounds, I guarantee that's happening out there. Absolutely. And that's why we're getting so many dogs dropped off at the shelter when they're no longer puppies. So if you want a puppy in your pictures on Instagram, just type in some AI program, like your picture and um, a puppy or whatever, or, or... or rent a puppy, or or whatever you got to do to get your picture on, but don't sacrifice that animal's life. Yeah. So those are those answers, and then the next answers you sort of touched on this, and that's baby or kitten or puppy, adolescent, young adult, adult, senior. And what is that? If you're going to get a puppy or a kitten or a baby, that's so much responsibility. A lot of work. There's a lot of energy. And you have to be ready for that and understand you have to baby-proof your house just like you would for a baby when you have a kitten or a puppy come in. You're going to need to spend a lot of time with it. They're going to make mistakes. You're going to have to train that animal, whether it's you or you're going to have to pay someone to train the animal. You you're, don't know what how what that dog's going to end up like. You don't know the personality the dog actually has. You don't know how the dog's temperament's going to be or the energy need of that dog. Because uh, we picked on huskies a little earlier. There are mellow huskies. There are mostly hyper huskies, but there are mellow huskies. And there are hyper pit bulls, but they're mostly couch potato pit bulls. So it's like you know more when you deal with an adolescent, you have a better idea of what kind of dog you have. Yep. Like if you're getting a dog that's eight months old from a shelter, the dog is close to its full size. You can tell by its paws it's going to get so much bigger. The personalities come out, may have training already. There's there's more that you know about the dog. And if you go with a young adult, you know more. If you go with an adult, you know even more. And if you go with a senior, just like when we get older, they're sort of kind of set in their ways. And um, you can teach an old dog new tricks. But um, – you know much more what you're getting. And I have friends, dear friends, who only adopt senior dogs. They're older themselves. They see the value in life. They see the benefit. And they want the attachment. They want the emotional commitment. And there are many groups that have specific seniors for seniors type adoptions. So if you're a senior and you don't want to make a 15-year commitment, that's an excellent um alternative for you and there are even groups that specialize in senior animals 100 percent. and so many rescues are looking for fosters and there are rescues that are just looking for fosters who want to take on seniors and so sometimes these rescues will take on the medical like i said before and so that's a big reason why some people don't want to adopt a senior but if they can be supported by rescue maybe that's the answer I will say my uh, parents adopted a not 
old puppy a few years ago, and I said to them, you're thinking very optimistically, aren't you? A hundred percent. Like we are only getting older. Every single one of us is only getting older. And if it's aches to go for a walk now, what's it going to be like in four years? Absolutely. So maybe you should get an older dog that doesn't need the same amount of exercise. You know, are you any less of a human that you're older? Why would you think an animal is any less of an animal or a dog or a cat when they're older? People need to think of animals as beings, individual creatures. And even the most problematic ones in the world, there are answers that are perfect for them. They're just conundrums. And like as a volunteer, I look at them as all little conundrums or little puzzles that I need to figure out. And if you may be the right answer for some of these animals out there that didn't fit otherwhere. But maybe in answering the right questions, you find out what animal is right for you. Again, ask not what animal is right for you, but ask yourself what animal you are right for. Great. And I'm going to just uh, touch a little bit on some cat things also while we're here. And this also, uh, I'm going to assume, applies to dogs. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. But one of the things I often have people come by is they're looking for a specific gender and age. And even though there are a lot of good generalities about animals of a particular age, there's also a lot of specifics to the animal. Their background may influence things. I have, um, for example, we currently have some cats that are about a year old, but they've already gone through birthing a litter of kittens. They're fairly happy to not be active and to get some rest. And they're definitely going to be more on the like cuddly side than you would normally expect a cat who's only a year old. And maybe in a couple of years, they'll actually become more active. But right now, because of the trauma of being so young and giving birth, that's what they want is they just want a place to like go and relax and not have cats climbing all over them. Um, and while you can make generalities about gender and if genders will get along, again, they're all individual personalities. So this is a great place to start, but also really look at the actual animal itself, I think, to really know if that specific animal is going to be a good fit for you. Yeah. Uh, what I would tag on that is that um, at the shelter, the animal in the kennel does not equal the animal in the yard, and the animal in the yard and in the kennel does not equal the animal at home. And the animal at home does not equal the animal that a specific handler took out at the shelter. So each scenario and each location and each different combination of factors contribute to how that animal will behave. Absolutely. Even in one foster home to another, the animal may be completely different because of the situation that they're put into. 100%. So I, I have a whole other page of questions I was going to have people write down and answer. But um, there's plenty of things that you can look up online. Uh, I wrote an article for your rescue about a year yes. or two ago uh, of questions that you should answer for yourself before you go to a rescue or a shelter. Uh, have those answers ahead of time so you can give to a volunteer or a staff member or a rescuer. And that'll help you find the right dog that you are right for or right cat that you are right for. So seek that out. Um, I'd also, we're running out of time, so I'd love to pimp my own Instagram. Absolutely. Because on my Instagram, I post hundreds of dogs and sometimes cats. Um, it's at Tom Keish, at T-O-M-K-I-E-S-C-H-E. You can see dogs from West Valley Animal Shelter, which is a city shelter, or Baldwin Park Animal Shelter, which is a county shelter. And sometimes I also feature other dogs that I meet in the rescue world or at other shelters. But please, please ask not what animal is right for you, but ask yourself what animal are you right for. If you answer that correctly, you will have a happy home, you will have a happy animal, and we will never see that animal back at a shelter. We're going to put all the links to that article and any other articles or things you'd like to put up, we will have on our Facebook page. That's the Animal Agenda Facebook page. And there will be links there that people can follow up and find all this information online as well. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me again. This is Melody King, and you've been listening to The Animal Agenda on KPFK. I've been talking with actor, author, animal activist, and shelter volunteer Tom Keish. Thank you, Tom, for joining us again. 
If you're enjoying this and other programs on this station, please consider making a donation by going to kpfk.org or by calling 818-985-5735. That's 818-985-KPFK. If you have suggestions for topics and guests, please message me on the Animal Agenda page on Facebook. Special thanks to my producer, Marlena Bond, and thank you for listening. Please tune in again to the Animal Agenda next Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Back. Thanks for having Welcome me Welcome back. back. So it was last week that people heard the program that we titled, Ask Not What Animals Right For You, But Ask Yourself, What Animal Are You Right For? And if people didn't hear that yet, please look it up in the archives. And if you like what you hear, please share it with your friends who are considering different animals or even if they want an animal in their life. Yes, and you can find that at kpfk.org slash archives. So we talked about like perfect world and what's less ideal and tackling preconceived ideas that people had about animals. And I teased the fact that I had a whole other page of questions um, that people should ask themselves. And we threw that people should look up an article that I wrote for your rescue in the past. And then people asked, what were those questions? So I'll just go over some of them. And then some of those questions that came in, you can ask me. I think sounds great. That sounds perfect. And then we'll just go down whatever rabbit hole we (laughs) fall down. So before people consider an animal, they should write down the answers to the following questions. You can give it to a rescue. You can give it to a volunteer. Or you can bring it with you to the shelter. Number one, where will the animal live? Will it be a small house? Will it be a big estate? Will you live in several different houses because you're going to travel and you're very well off and you have a private plane? Will it live in an apartment? Will it live on the street? I'm sorry, but that is a reality. There are some animals that will live with homeless uh, homeless people or homeless neighbors, I guess we call um, that situation at this time. Will it live outside even though you live in a home? 100%. Will it live in a backyard? Will it live close to neighbors? Will it live with other animals? We'll live with other dogs. How small of a space will it be? How small of a yard will it be? How big is that outdoor space? How high is that fence? That's when, a great one. When we ask that question at the shelter, you see people go blank because they don't even think about that. It's like a four-foot fence. At my age, I can get over <laughs> And if I can get over a four-foot fence, a young, energetic super dog can easily get over that fence. Yes. I, I'll tell a little story. I was volunteering at a shelter, and I was cleaning yards. And the yards have gate latches. And while I clean the yards, with sanit- sanitize the yards, it's at the county of Los Angeles, I take out some dogs, and I put the dog in a yard I've already cleaned, I close the gate, and I go to the next yard and start cleaning. This one dog I I take out is smart enough not only to flip the latch and join me in the yard I'm cleaning, but then I put collars on the latches, like dog collars, so they couldn't flip the latch, and I would watch this dog trying to figure out how to pick the collar and get to me in the other yard just to play, just to want to play. So one day I took the dog out. I gave the dog a pineapple, a little squeaky pineapple, which plays into the story. And we took the pineapple with the dog to the yard, put the dog and the pineapple into yard A, and I cleaned yard B, clicked the latch uh, with a collar, and I'm in yard B, and I'm cleaning yard B, and I turn around, and there's the dog standing next to me with the pineapple. (laughs) I look back. The latch is still latched because he figured, okay, that doesn't work anymore. I looked at the collar. It's still on there because he figured, okay, I can't pick, quote unquote, the collar anymore, the lock, the dog just leaped over the fence, seven foot fence. Wow. And the dog's just standing next to me with the pineapple. Like, hey, dad, hey, look what I did. Look (laughs) what I did. You've got me in that yard. So how high is your fence? And what lives in that outdoor area now? Do you have visiting cats? Do you have... um, raccoons or a family of squirrels that you love to interact with like how important is that with you because some dogs aren't going to get along with squirrels and if feeding a squirrel a peanut every day which i guess technically we're not allowed to do but if that's something that's important to you 
that's probably not going to happen when you have a super high energy dog in that backyard. You're probably going to say goodbye to those squirrels. One of the things that I often tell people, we live in an area that has a lot of wildlife, a lot of coyotes, and there are things called coyote rollers that you can put on top of your fence to help keep coyotes out of your yard. So it it shouldn't just be about keeping your animal in. It's also about keeping other animals out if you want to protect your pet. Um, and I suspect the coyote rollers also make it difficult for a dog to escape the other way. Exactly. hundred percent. So that's a great point about wildlife because that's, again, who lives in your yard. So um, coyotes visit backyards. It's how it is unless you have fences that are designed to keep them out you have to be cautious about that because if you have the wrong size dog with a hungry coyote and they're motivated enough you may not have a little dog anymore that is very true unfortunately so and the other thing you brought up which i love is i tell people you don't just protect your pet Excuse me. You just don't get a pet for your protection, but you also have to protect your pet. So you have to protect them from other wildlife. You have to protect them from other um, unsocialized dogs. You have to protect them from children, as weird as that sounds. But dogs may make mistakes when children do inappropriate things to your dogs. And you have to protect them from people on the street who might do inappropriate things for your dog. So all dogs are wired with their own personalities and their own sets of rules. And so you have to protect your animal from making the wrong decision when uh, someone outside that person or you or the dog makes an inappropriate action towards your animal. I was walking a dog the other day in the park and a very adorable toddler in a dress starts running directly at her with her arms outstretched. And I know this particular dog is a little scared of, of children. And, and I think the parents' faces and my faces all changed at the same moment. People like, uh-oh. And so I immediately got in between the dog and the kid. Not because I want, didn't want the kid to have the great experience, but I wanted to make sure that she was protected, the dog was protected. Because if that dog bites that kid that dog might get euthanized. Yep. It, it is a one-time mistake that you need to prevent. You need to do everything you can to prevent. Yeah, our society is very good at blaming animals and very poor at putting the responsibility where it should be. And we get a lot of dogs at the shelters that come in because they bit a kid. And nobody ever asks, what did the kid do? And the truth is, it was probably the child that pushed the buttons on that animal yeah. inappropriately. So it's protecting the animals that you get. Um, back to this list, who lives with you? The ages, so are they young kids, are they teenagers, or are they elderly? What's the temperament of people? Not only the dog, but the people. You know, are, is there arguments in the house? We had a dog returned because the the dog owner and their parent who were living together always got in, like, arguments. And it was such a stressful environment for the animal that the animal became kind of stressed and kind of started acting inappropriately because it was a toxic environment for the animal to live in. So are there humans in the house other than the you, uh, other than the primary owner? Are there cats? Are there dogs? Are there birds? Are there allergies? So who lives there now and who may live there in the future? Because relationships come and go, unfortunately. And yes. so you have to be aware of that. Not all dogs get along with everybody. And, you know, if you buy a dog or adopt a dog with your current... Significant other. Exactly. And you guys break up, who ends up with the dog? This is a question that people should ask, or cat. You should ask that question before you get the animal, no matter how uncomfortable it is. Because we have a dog at West Valley right now, a beautiful little um, French bulldoggy type. His name is Bongo. I'm pretty sure he's still going to be there by the time you listen to this, because um, we're not doing this live. But he's there because of a divorce. Now, if you can explain that to me, I'll give you a cookie. Like, I don't understand how... 
I can understand parties fighting over who gets the animal. I don't understand parties surrendering the animal because neither one wants the animal. Yeah, he's there. And sometimes it's because the dog or cat reminds people of the significant other. And so it's too painful to have the animal. I'm Melody King, and you're listening to The Animal Agenda on KPFK. Today, my guest is actor, author, animal activist, and shelter volunteer, Tom Keish. Yeah, thank I know that. radio is not a visual medium, but you, you can probably hear my eyes rolling. Yeah, it's crazy. And uh, it's not fair. And again, ask not what animal's right for you, but ask yourself, what animal are you right for? So um, back to my list. How much human time will an animal get each day? Is there a plan? So I think one of our questions was, how much time does an animal require? Wasn't that something someone asked? Sorry. I thought um, they require a lot of time. Um, if you have um, a very active, very athletic young dog, it's going to require significant walks every day. And if you don't walk that animal significantly every day, the animal may take it out on you or your furniture or your yard out of frustration. And you need to have a fairly regular schedule when you have a dog that you're training, whether you're crate training um, or not. Just, you know, you need to be able to come take it out on bathroom breaks at specific times. Um, so you need to be able to accommodate the pet into your schedule it's not i think it's also just not not how much time but the organization of the time as well yes so one of the saddest things i, th I think someone asked a question about this too about being a volunteer is seeing an animal in a kennel which may have two sections a cubby and a yard quote unquote which the yard is probably eight feet by four feet concrete and steel um and the cubby is maybe half that size with a little caranda bed in there that's, quote, unquote, indestructible, indestructible. One of the saddest things is seeing a dog in there that has been house trained. And yet they are not getting out of that kennel for days or weeks at a time because there's just not enough volunteers to walk that dog. And it's not in the staff's contract to take dogs out of their kennels. And you watch that dog for the first couple of days stressing out. Because it's trying to be a good dog and not poop, quote, in the house. And you finally see that dog break. Now, you might say to me, Tom, why don't you take that dog out then? And I would say, A, I'm not at the shelter every day. I go to a couple shelters. B, there's 200 to 500 other dogs at that same shelter, depending what shelter you're at. And there's very few volunteers, and that's the truth, that are willing to take dogs out even once a week. So that is sad. Now you take that dog and you put that dog in a new home and that person expects that dog to be perfectly house trained right out of the box, quote unquote. That's equally unfair. Yes, especially since it's had to unlearn everything that it's learned. hundred percent. So dogs require time. There's that three by three by three rule and you know that obviously and it's it's a general guesstimate of time that for three days an animal has to decompress from where they've been it's like if you were in federal prison and you were keyed up for three days you may eat everything in every refrigerator and cabinet and you may sleep the rest of the time or you may bounce off the walls or you may you know want to hug everybody you come in contact with or you may not want to talk to anybody Three days, decompression. Three weeks of, hey, wow, this is neat. Where am I? Who are you? What's the scenario? What's the rules? How do I get along? Who's that cat? Who's that dog? What's that smell? And then three months of, at the end of three months, it's like, this is me. This is my life. I can relax. You're not going anywhere. You get up at 7.30 every morning and take me for a walk so I can hold it. You come home at 5.30 every day and take a walk so I can hold it. And it's like learning a pattern and getting that in your brain and being like, this is my life. I can do this. 
Yes, that's a that's a great rule for people to know about. Three by three by three. It's it's pretty well known at this point. So, the going back to the list, have you ever owned a dog before, or a cat before? What's your experience? What's the experience level of everyone in that household? What is your animal IQ? What's your dog IQ? What's your cat IQ? Is there a behavior plan? Is there an agreement with everybody in the household on that on that plan? So another sad thing is I saw a dog that was returned because or not returned, surrendered because the dog was crazy, quote unquote. And to prove that, someone sent me a video of a dog and the dog was in a kitchen and this group of people all off camera put a piece of cheese on the trash can, on the lid of the trash can. And you could hear the different voices encouraging the dog to eat the cheese and laughing because the dog was stressed. And you could see it. If you had any empathy for an animal, you could look at the animal's eyes and see how stressed the animal was. Because if you put yourself in the position of the animal, you know that dog got yelled at for going in that trash can before to get food. And yet they chose to put a piece of cheese on the trash can. And they all found it funny because the dog was stressed out and hearing these commands to eat the cheese and people laughing and all you could feel all the feels that that dog would feel just from this video of a dog looking at a piece of cheese and while it might be funny for someone on instagram it was confusing as heck for that dog and so we get a dog that they say is crazy and i took that dog out the first time and just realized that just the dog needs structure the dog needs a place that everybody's on the same page The dog just needs everyone to follow the same rules and give the dog the same rules so the dog can be a good dog. That's incredibly sad that people are that cruel. And yeah, I do see a lot of things on Instagram where it's, it it appears to be cute. And I'm just sitting there thinking this is not going to end well. For the radio audience, I just want to point out that her eyes are all wet with sadness right now. She's not She's not joking. Um, yeah, it's – I don't think they thought it was cruel. I thought. I think they thought it was funny, and they didn't realize it was cruel. Because I think part of the problem with our society is the lack of empathy for animals. And understanding their behavior. I would like to think that some of it is lack of knowledge and not just – jerkiness yeah um it's low animal iq and it's low empathy and that's we talked about this last week it's like raise your animal iq volunteer get your hands on fur get around lots of different animals different sizes different breeds mentor or have a mentor at a as a as a volunteer hang out with more experienced volunteers watch youtube videos from experienced trainers that are legit not just Herky jerky morons, but it's really important to have a high animal IQ and also a high animal empathy. And I think if everyone had more empathy, the world would be a much better place. Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the questions we had was, so I've decided I'm going to bring this animal into my home, and what uh, what are some things I can do to prepare my actual home? For this animal. Yeah, so I think that that is exactly what we just talked about in a way. Yes. With sort of a more additional. So get on the same page before you get an animal. Come up with the rules of the house before you bring an animal in the house. Are they allowed on the sofa? Are they allowed in the bed? 100%. Because if, if one person in the household lets the dog on the bed and another person doesn't, the dog or animal is going to get confused. Um, you know, whether or not you want the dog to walk on your right side or left side, that's pretty much arbitrary in my opinion. But some people, if you're going to scold the dog for being on the wrong side, then make sure everybody's walking the dog on the same side. As yes. silly as that sounds. Come up with the rules. Decide whether or not you're going to crate train ahead of time and learn how to do that before you get the animal. Um, some people find crate training cruel, but you will find that most volunteers that foster or have dogs believe crates are important it gives the animal 
a place for the animal to go when they are uncomfortable and when they want to feel safe. It's no different than a teenager with their own bedroom or their own private space in a house or even a man cave. It's just a place for the dog to call their own. And if a kid comes over, a baby comes over, and they may be adolescent, and you have to protect your animal from that child or just your teenager has a bunch of kids over that stress has out your dogs, nobody touches the animal in their crates. That's their room and the animal feels safe and secure. And most animals, at least in the cat and dog world, they prefer small spaces. People think when when you're bringing home a cat and I say, put it, they say, we don't have room, put it in the bathroom, I tell them. Because animals like to be able to see where their threats are coming from. And so having, being surrounded and being in a close space makes them feel safer and they have more awareness of where the threat could be coming from. There's only one direction. And that's why chained dogs get very aggressive. They aren't chained because they're aggressive dogs. They become aggressive because they're constantly stressed because they have no idea where a threat can come from. And that's why dogs have dog houses outside. Um, The crate is essentially an indoor dog house. If you want proof of this, get a box, open it up and see where your cat hangs out. Absolutely. Or they're when sometimes when they're stressed, they go straight to the litter box just because it's uh, that tiny space. And I, I believe personally that there's also a connection between pressure on the parasympathetic nervous system that helps to calm and relax them. I'm Melody King, and you're listening to The Animal Agenda on KPFK. My guest today is actor, author, animal activist, and shelter volunteer Tom Keish. There's cats at the shelter right now that are sitting in litter boxes because they're stressed out. Yes. Yeah, 100%. I see that all the time. So back to the list, exercise level. What's the exercise level that you and your household are willing to do? And who's willing to do it? And if you're saying, my kids will do it, well, where are your kids going to be four years from now? And how old are you going to be? And what's your physical condition? And what's your time commitment? So be honest about that. We all get older. Relationships end. And new things happen. And are you going to be in a position with your career and your job in four or five years to have the same amount of time that you have now? So I think that's important for this list. What's the exercise level commitment that you are willing to do? I I think we should say because there is constant change in your life, just because you shouldn't not get an animal just because you're going to have change. You just have to be willing to adapt. Yeah. So I have a cat. As 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 weird as it is. I have a cat, and it's because I wasn't allowed to have a dog that I started volunteering with two decades ago, at least. Um, That's why I started volunteering with dogs. And then the place I've lived for a while, my landlord was sick of me asking if I could have a dog, and finally he says, you can have a cat. And then coincidentally, within like three months of that, a cat started showing up at my door, and I was shared it with the neighbor and the woman I was living with, and they've all moved away, and the cat's mine now. It's my cat. And while that cat um doesn't really fit my life. I made a commitment to that cat. I wish the cat traveled more. I wish the cat was easier to take places. He's not, but I made a commitment. He's my cat. He's my responsibility. And so while your life may be fluid, if you can't make a lifetime commitment to an animal, and I talked about this last week, then foster or volunteer or visit, or house sit, or house pet sit, or buy a stuffed animal, or just punch in something on AI to make you happy. So, yes, lives are fluid, but an animal is a lifetime commitment. Uh, Back to this list, what sort of affection are you looking for in an animal? What's their personality? Like, some people want a couch potato, and if you want a couch potato, you don't get a baby active super athletic dog like a belgian malinois punch up amazing belgian malinois on instagram and if you're not ready for that kind of commitment don't get one they will go skydiving they will climb buildings they will leap fences and rivers i mean they are a lot of dog but if that's your lifestyle and your commitment level great perfect get one but be honest with yourself and we're, we're getting close to the end again but what's your tolerance to sound You want a talkative dog, you want a quiet dog, just know the dog at the shelter in the kennel is not the dog in the yard, that's not the dog at your home, that's not the dog in every situation. 
but that is an important thing. If you're if you don't want a talkative dog, you may want to stay away from huskies. They tend to be vocal. Um, how much training will your new pet get? By whom and for how long? Happy people continue learning throughout their lives. Why would we expect our dogs not to be the same? Because people say you can't teach an old dog new tricks, which is, which is not true. Which is baloney. Dogs want to have experiences just like people want to have experiences. So happy dogs do scent training all the time or, or play scent games, you know, like they smell things in the yard. You can do that on purpose. You can put treats in boxes and have dogs discover them. They, they want to have new experiences. They want to go new places. I keep p- picking on Huskies, but Huskies just want to go over there. They don't even know where over there is. They just want to go just want and to go run. and go. And they will climb under a fence or dig under a fence, chew through a fence, jump over a fence. There's been dogs that have jumped through plate glass windows. If you're not exercising your dog appropriately, they will do it themselves, and that will cause you economic and emotional hardships. And I want to say this also applies to kittens. Kittens are highly active and if they are not provided enough stimulation, they will come to you repeatedly, generally at night when you would like to sleep. They will find things in your place that may not be cat toys and they will become cat toys. Things will get broken off your shelves. Um, and that is why we always ask people to adopt kittens in pairs. They can entertain each other. And frankly, as as a person who does need to go out of town on occasion, I find having multiple cats to have be a much, my cats are much happier being multiple cats. I'll never go back to having just one. I feel less guilty leaving them alone. They have someone to play with. But particularly with kittens, I've had so many p- people, they return kittens because the kittens are very active. Or they come back and say, I need a cat for my cat. And it would be so much easier to make a good personality match if you get them at the same time, or they're the same age, they know each other. So please, if you are considering adopting a kitten, please consider adopting two. I hear that from the guinea pig people and the bunny people as well. And um, uh, all sorts of small animals. And dogs are happier in pairs as well. Um, uh, I feel like we're getting towards the end again. I'm, I got a couple more on my list. Uh Size, how big is too big? How big are you? How big will the animal be uh, in six months or 18 months? And then grooming, baths, brushing, nails, teeth. Some breeds require professional grooming or clippers. And who's doing it? And some shed heavily. What's your tolerance on that? So that's pretty much my list. You can look it up below. And to go to size, I just want to say, and also strength, because if you have a dog, you need to be able to have the strength to control your dog in any situation. Yeah. So. Yeah. I always tell volunteers, new volunteers that I'm mentoring, I ask them what your weight is and what's half your weight and realize any dog that's more than half your weight, you really should consider, um, reconsider or get back up or whatever, because they are so much stronger than we are. And a dog half your weight can pull you around if they're not trained and you don't know them. So be responsible that way. Um, Anyway, I want to plug my Instagram because I post dogs there all the time from shelters that need home, that need out. It's at Tom Keish, T-O-M-K-I-E-S-C-H-E. You can see dogs from L.A. City shelters or county shelters. And, um, yeah, please share this program, I think, with people that are considering. But, again, ask not what animal is right for you, but ask yourself, what animal are you right for? Thank you, Tom, for being here and doing this again. <laughs> thank you, everybody, to ask questions, and thank you for having me again. This is Melody King, and you've been listening to The Animal Agenda on KPFK. I've been talking with actor, author, animal activist, and shelter volunteer Tom Keish. Thank you, Tom, for joining us again. If you're enjoying this and other programs on this station, please consider making a donation by going to kpfk.org or by calling 818-985-5735. That's 818-985-KPFK. If you have suggestions for topics and guests, please message me on the Animal Agenda page on Facebook. Special thanks to my producer, Marlena Bond, and thank you for listening. Please tune in again to the Animal Agenda next Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. KPFK is beginning to wind down our fund drive, but we still have quite a ways to go to reach our goal and meet our operating expenses. 
so we really need to call on those of you who are in a position to do so to pledge your support right now to help this important community institution continue. Your financial support provides the stability that this station requires to continue bringing you important fact-based journalism unfiltered by corporate demands. Please allow KPFK to thrive by pledging at whatever level you're able to at kpfk.org. If you'd rather call in your support, you can do so as well at 818-985-5735. Since 1949, this network, Pacifica, has been committed to directly addressing the globe's most pressing issues. If you're passionate about any of the topics that we regularly focus on here at KPFK, then please make your contribution now. Every contribution is important. Whether it's a single gift at the basic membership level of $25 or monthly installments of $25 or anything in between or beyond, 